Please open your Bibles to Psalm 105. Some of you are going to jump the gun, those of you who have been around for so many years, and you're going to say, I know exactly what Pastor Scott's going to do. We'll see. We shall see. Psalm 105, in this opening verse, O give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. And if one were to count, enumerate the deeds, as the psalmist does in this one psalm, there are perhaps more than 40 acts or deeds of God that the psalmist is just going to do that, make known. And interestingly enough, what is contained in this one psalm took almost maybe four or five books to uh, give the full detail for. But regardless of this framework, as abridged as it is, it gives you a nice picture as the psalmist goes on to tell about all the acts and deeds of the Lord. And of course, some of you have already guessed I'm jumping back into Joseph again today. And so I am going to, right in the midst of, as the psalmist is declaring the works of God, we pick up right where Joseph is in verse 17. Don't make the mistake of thinking you know the message. We need to have some of these Bible truths repeated and repeated and repeated because we're hard of hearing. And then we become uh, the know-it-alls. Yeah, I know this one. But I really want you to take it today as a refreshing reminder and perhaps more importantly, a better understanding of what God does in our lives the things that we think are ordered by God, that superficially perhaps some may even criticize and say they're not. It says here in verse 17, Psalm 105, verse 17, he sent a man, that is God sent a man before them, that is the Israelites, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, a, a slave, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron. Until the time that his word, that is the word of God, came, the word of the Lord tried him. Now don't run ahead of me and think, well, I, I know what happens here. Let's first do a little chronology here. It says that God sent a man. I put a note in my Bible here. His brethren sold him, but God sent him. You know, a lot of times we we could look at the events of our life and think we have so messed it up, but perhaps the real secret of the walk of faith is that perhaps God either lets the mess-ups in or sometimes they are by design. But it says here very clearly that God sent a man, that is Joseph, before them, his brethren, sold for a servant. I said last week he went from favorite son to favored slave, and eventually for the time, for this time, the chronicle of Joseph's life, savior essentially of the people of that time from starving to death. So you see this wonderful, I call it the tapestry of God, to send a son, a beloved son, to become a servant or a slave, and to become savior. And Joseph indeed is a beautiful type and picture of Christ. That's not my focus right now. I just point out that God sent a man, and he sent him. It says, whose feet they hurt with fetters, he was laid in iron. The Hebrew does read correctly that iron entered into his soul. In fact, um, I'll read from the 26th translation, but the Hebrew, iron entered into his soul until the time that his word which is one Hebrew word I'll show you on the board. The word of the Lord tried him. So first, from the 26th translation, um, it says here, when he summoned a famine in the land and broke every staff of bread, he sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. His feet were hurt with fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron. 
until what he had said came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. That's one. Another translation says he sent famine upon the land. He broke the very staff of life. He dispatched a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold into slavery. They forced his feet into fetters. His body was put in iron until the time that his utterances were actually fulfilled. The promise of the Lord tested him severely. Now, there is a, a need for me at least to say a few things here about one, this iron. If you were reading, it says, iron entered into his nephesh, into his soul. That's exactly what the Hebrew reads. And I'd say that is the chronicle of Joseph's life. But there's a beautiful natural application just in the physical realm, which has nothing to do with this type of iron, the, the trial, the testing, the toughness. But in the natural, strictly in the chemical makeup of the body, iron is needed. Too much iron, and we are toxic. Not enough iron, and we're anemic. Just in the, if you try and combine the natural and the spiritual, because there are laws in both, not enough iron being brought into the saint's life creates an anemic Christian, forgive the term, someone who doesn't understand what the iron is for, and too much, by the way. There are some people who revel in toxicity. They revel in it. So you can see the, the natural and the spiritual laws actually mesh well together. In this case, the iron entered into his soul until the time that his word, the word that was uttered, the first utterance, that foretelling or prophetic word originally, the word of the Lord tried him. Now, I'm going to tackle the words for word. They're two different Hebrew words. But I'd like to talk about the word tried first. Your King James, simply reading the way it does, does not convey the Hebrew concept of this particular word, which is used as testing metal. There are diverse words for testing in Hebrew. In fact, we've covered many of them. This one is used specifically of testing metal. So it's no accident that the psalmist, in penning this, uses the concept of iron, iron entered into his soul, and then the promised word of God tried him like a metallurgist tries metal to see what's, what it's made out of and to remove some of the uh, lesser desired content. So the Hebrew just technically reads, we have here uh, until, uh, construct of, until, time of, strange little word in a construct, which is the, the coming to pass. And here we have the first word for word. I'll give you the second one is right beside it. You can see the King James translates both using the same English words, but they're two different words. Very, very difficult to explain that these two words are used so often. In fact, this one word here we studied in our Hebrew lesson, devaro, which is the word of him. Um, very difficult to understand in its use, I think, in 14, 1,400 instances in Scripture is going to be translated by 85 different English words. That tells you this is one where the, it has such an ambiguous realm that to try and pinpoint it exactly would be quite difficult, although the context of our scripture will give, give the true and full meaning of this particular word, devour. So until the word of him, that is the word that was prophetically uttered, the word that was proclaimed but not yet realized. The word, this particular word, which I believe strongly has great relationship to another Hebrew word, which we've looked at many times, emet or amen, the truth, the steadfastness, a relative perhaps of that word. So translated in some instances, as I read to you, the promise 
of God. And as I said, the translations are so difficult to make because these two words, if you were to look them up in the Strong's Concordance, you will read, and the word of the Lord came to, and the word of the Lord that came to so-and-so might read like this, and it might read like that. So, for our purpose today, I want you to see that iron entered into Joseph's soul until, until the time of the coming to pass of the word that the words that he, he uttered, that he spoke, that he declared. For Joseph had a dream, and we know in part that we, I think we've covered it some, he had a dream. He shared with his brothers who hated him. He was the beloved son of his father of that wonderful wife he loved so much, Rachel, who's now deceased. He has a dream, and he tells his brothers that essentially they're all going to bow down and worship him, and they don't like that very much. And then he says he has another dream, and that other dream essentially is that everything, the brothers, and it says the, the sun and the moon, which is being referenced as Jacob slash Israel and the mother, but it's also represent, representational of everything that is required to exist, the sun and the moon, the, uh, the need for uh, existence, light and darkness, the, everything that exists in the universe focused around these two elements. These will all bow down and do obeisance to him. These are his dreams. His brothers hear these utterances. And it says plainly that until the time of the coming to pass of, of this particular word that he declared, until that time, and you'll read in Genesis today, it'll say, and it came to pass, and it came to pass, and it came to pass. And they chose that for a reason, because in the process of things happening, as disastrous as they may have looked on the surface, the word of God was in process the beginning of coming to pass. So until that time, the promise of God, the command of God, of Yahweh, tested him like metal. Now I love this because if I were to just lift this out and do a lesson just on this particular verse, we could make a great application today and say many times, we claim things revealed in the scripture we claim them, and then it's as though we are tested all the day long until the thing comes to its fulfillment. Now, this is not the exact meaning, but take it to yourself today and realize that this particular lesson not only gives us the ability to know God, yes, God has a plan, God's in control, but perhaps periodically God will put us in places that don't look favorable. I coined this message with uh, in prison for a purpose. Now, that's Joseph's chronicle. But most people wouldn't think of disasters and disappointment and doom coming into their life as a part of God's plan. So, with this as the backdrop and the understanding of this scripture, I am going to take you into, back into Genesis, we are going to camp out a little bit in the Chronicles of Joseph. And uh, while you're turning, I've just kind of recapped a little bit of the history, uh, but I'll have you go to chapter 39. We'll start at the end of chapter 39. While you're turning there, I want to tell you what's so interesting about what God does. I had purposed in my heart at some point I would do this message. And why? Because I have felt very strongly that sometimes God has to bring us to a place. He has to bring us to a place, and then we may understand, we may receive comfort, we may grab hold of and appropriate all the things that God's Word says. So it's interesting that a week or two ago, a lady friend of mine, asked me a question. She said, I encountered someone who is extremely dogmatic. They are incredibly Calvinistic, and in their mind, they would like to, to uh, 
indoctrinate me into everything is wound up and everything that God does. If you are the chosen and elect of God, I, oh, I loathe this mindset, but that's just my personal opinion there speaking. Uh, but if you are indeed the chosen of God, chosen and elect, and you stay on that straight and narrow path, and all the things that God has predestined and foreordained for your life will come to pass exactly as he has laid them out. And I said to this lady, I said, uh, did the conversation ever come up as to free will? Did that ever enter into the equation? Because my Bible tells me very clearly that God gave free will to man. He gave it. We see it clearly in the garden. He gave a measure of himself when he breathed into Adam. He gave that which he had the capacity to do, freedom. And the essence, at least in the Old Testament, the essence of sin is the misuse of freedom, which is what we see Adam and Eve do in the garden. Now, if everything was wound up as this person suggested, there would never be a chronicle of Joseph's life. Favored son of Rachel would never have been sold into slavery and would never have ended up in prison. We may say that's all part of God's plan. And there are so many diverse factors in this. We could say just about him being sold into slavery. What if the timing was off that maybe he didn't stay in the pit long enough or maybe one of his brothers came to rescue him and he never ended up in Potiphar's house to serve as a slave in a foreign land? And we keep going down the path. And I'm trying to explain that, yes, God has a plan for your life and he has a plan for my life. But in the process of working out his plan, he also gave me free will, the free will to mess it up, which I have, and some of you have, probably all of you have. Let's be honest here. And that's the beautiful part about what God does. He does not say that he called you and chose you to walk this perfect, straight and narrow way. So when I heard all of this talk, I, I almost had to sit this lady down. I said, please, let me share something with you. And I begin to relate the story of Joseph, to talk about Joseph's life. And Joseph is not the person leading the lineage down to Christ per se. We find that in the chapter, the previous chapter, in the debacle of Judah and Tamar, in that terrible, disgusting chapter, we have children born out of a true, uh, let me find a nice word, debauch relationship, uh, passing ships in the night kind of but not really thing. Uh, children, these two children that are born will be the line to Christ, which tells me God will even use that, which to the... So the natural eye says that cannot be God's plan, that cannot be God's will, that isn't God's way. So I felt the need because every once in a while, there'll be somebody rear their head in my path who wants to really kind of tell every person around them, including sometimes me, which I won't listen. In fact, I told this lady, I said, why don't you do what the Apostle Paul did in Galatians? Henceforth... You all know where I'm going. Let no man trouble me. I bear in my body the marks, the stigmata of the Lord Jesus Christ. Get out of my face. Get out of my way. Right? Because when it comes to religion, we've said this many times here, everybody's an expert. They want to tell you how much they know to bring confusion into your life. So you can walk around frustrating the grace of God, and never coming to that peaceful knowledge that just what the book of Ephesians declared, he chose you out from among others he did not choose. He gave you the breath, just as Adam, through his spirit, the dynamis, the dynamite of God to enliven you, to quicken you. And don't let anybody tell you that along the pathway, you cannot deviate and fall off and including disappear from the frame, I know. <sighs> the same person brought up the one saved, always saved, because if you really have been saved, then you can never fall off the track. Really? <laughs> then I must not be saved. And some of you must not be saved. 
or that person doesn't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> right? Because what is described in our, in the Bible, I'm reading at least the, this particular version that I'm reading, the last time I checked, uh, tells me that God cherished freedom so much, he risked sin. He gave that, and he has given that. And if, if we're just nothing but a bunch of clocks that are wound up, then according to this person, there's a clock with your name on it that God wound up so tightly, and when you came on the scene, the clock just starts to slowly unwind itself until it, it has no more life in it and it just stops. And everything that God has wound into there will unfold exactly the way the winding occurred. Uh, what I love about this word is it lets me know that's the importance of preaching grace. If it was just as easy as taking hold of God's word and never, ever stepping off the track, why would we need God's grace? Why would I need to stand here and say, this church, really, I've come to this absolute peace at this point in my ministry to say, this church exists to talk to people out there and in this sanctuary who know without God, they would be dead. Without God, they could do nothing. Without God in their lives, they wouldn't exist. They wouldn't have their being. So it was kind of ironic as I had this scripture in my back pocket thinking about what this woman had said. I said, you know, it's needful that I go back and revisit this to make sure that people who are listening today who may be in the grips of what I've called the prison for a purpose might understand that your pathway, your, uh, the placing of your feet wherever you've walked, even if it includes right now today the discouragement and disappointment of something that didn't turn out the way you expected it to, take some comfort from God's word one, that God can make it work out even when we mess up. He knows how to enter in. Romans 8, 28 says, He enters into all things to work His good. doesn't mean that it starts off exactly the pathway, exactly the way my idea of the way I should have gone and God's idea, because He declared it, might have been two different things. But to those that are the called, He enters into He'll go to work and begin to sort out, but you may have to pass through and pass through the darkness and disappointment and things that don't appear to be right on the surface. You'd say, this cannot be God. But I'm telling you, even for this man, Joseph, discouragement will either drive you to look towards God and have more hope, or it will bring you to despair. The same situation can either make you press so close that you cannot, you couldn't be beaten away with a stick, or you'll just begin to lose your grip and fall away saying, none of this is even relevant in my life. God must not care about me. Why do I need this? And believe me, as someone who has stood for the better part of now beginning my eighth year, but behind me, the years behind me of watching people come and thinking the minute they came to the ministry, it was just going to be okay. And how many letters do I read to you on festival every week where people call and say, I started watching and everything's gone wrong. Have you considered the fact that, A, the attack is very great from the opposing forces, but also God may put you to the test to see what you're going to do in those, I've said this many times, what you will do in those circumstances that seem impossible. And the eyes of faith wrap themselves around what God has declared what God has already revealed, and sometimes that promise will even test us. How many times have you claimed the promise for something and you wait for the promise to become reality? Let's take one of those very uh, gentle ones. You feel lonely, you feel alone, you feel abandoned, and you claim the promise that God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And yet those feelings of uh, despondency and loneliness keep creeping back and they keep coming back. It is your and my reaching into what God has already de declared, taking hold of that word of promise 
until it becomes a reality. And in the process, before it becomes a reality, I may be like metal. I may be tested on what I'm latching on to. Am I really latching on to God's word, or am I still leaning on the arm of the flesh? So all that is background for the message today. And we encounter Joseph being hated by his brothers. That should give some of you some comfort that in your family, if people hate you, don't think that you're special. <laughs> in fact, just as a sidebar, having nothing to do with this, I, I sat reading the scriptures and I thought, you know what's remarkable? This child, Joseph, young man, was the favored and reminded me greatly of Isaac and Ishmael in terms of the relationship, how the brothers mocked him and ridiculed him. Reminded me of that same relationship. Anyone who is crazy enough to latch hold and say, I'm a child of God and I claim that promise, prepare yourself to be ridiculed by those who are of bondage and works, who will say, you know what? You're wasting your time. Go my way, otherwise you're a fool. The life of faith is laden with all of these diverse problems and personages given to us as an example to say, we're not alone. We're not alone. So we know his brothers hated him. They hated him because he was the favorite son of Jacob. And we see him being sold into bondage, serving in Potiphar's house, being tempted, as we looked at last week, being tempted by Potiphar's wife, and she managed to grab hold of his garment, and he refused to be with her but fled, so what was left in her hand was his clothes. That must have been a sight. <laughs> and he's thrown in prison. Thrown in prison, by the way, for doing the right thing, which, you know, I, I go into the prisons all the time. I hear that a lot. I really didn't do it. I didn't do it. But this guy really didn't do it, all right? So there is one person here who didn't do it. Um, but it says here, Joseph's master in verse 20, chapter 39, verse 20, Joseph's master took him, put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph, showed him mercy, gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison, and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. Seems wherever he goes, he prospers. No matter what's going on, this man is given position of responsibility, and he prospers. He's a good steward of no matter what he does. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, and the Lord made it to prosper. And here we go. I'd like you to circle some words as I go by them. Uh, chapter 40 begins with, And it came to pass after these things. You will not see it in your English, but the Hebrew reads as part of these things. The these things, here is your word. It has a definite article in front of it, but here is your word. So we don't necessarily see it as we're reading the English but the Hebrew is very clear that after these things, in fact, forgive my uh, color scheme here, but everything, I showed you this on festival, everything that is green is, is reading, uh, it came to pass, and it came to pass, what is green in my Bible. So you can see there's a lot of those, and it came to pass, all culminating in that word. It is not that that word had yet come to pass, but these were the steps leading up to the word, the prophetic foretold word, word becoming a reality. And it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was very wroth against the two of his officers, and you know the story. They're, they're all in prison there in the, in the jail, and each man looks very sad. Joseph says, what's the matter? And they both said they had dreams. And something with Joseph, maybe the food or something, or the atmosphere. Everybody has dreams. So they had dreams. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph, verse 9, said to him, In my dream, 
behold, a vine was before me. In the vine there were three branches, and it was as though it budded, and her blossom shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes, and Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. I took the grapes, pressed them. Oh, this sounds really good. I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Joseph said unto him, this is the interpretation of it. Three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up thine head, restore thee unto thy place. Thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former ma manner when thou wast his butler. And very clearly here, uh, King James says, but think on me. Cross that out and write, remember me, because he tells him twice. Remember me when it shall be well with thee. Remember me and show kindness, I pray thee. You ever ask somebody to do that for you? Something in passing, hey, if, you know, if you get a chance. And most of those people are so self-consumed, they couldn't even bother to, it's all about me. This is the same thing here. Remember me. When it will be well with you, show kindness, I pray thee unto me. Make mention of me unto Pharaoh. Bring me out of this house. This is the only place where there's a little hint of a complaint. Not much, just a little bit. He says, for I was indeed stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews. And here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. Hmm. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. I love this. Me too, me too. Oh boy, this is good news. This guy got a good, he got a good report. Oh boy, I want, I want to know about my dream too. Yeah, yeah. Okay, be ready because what you ask for, you will receive. Chief Baker saw the inter interpretation was good, said unto Joseph, I also was in my dream, three white baskets on my head. In the uppermost basket, there was all manner of baked uh, meats for Pharaoh. And the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. Doesn't that sound beautiful? <laughs> Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation. Three baskets or three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift thy head from my... He's going to off with your head, hang you on a tree, and the birds are going to eat the flesh off your head. <laughs> Next. <laughs> it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants, lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants, and restored the chief butler to his butlership again, gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. If you are a G. Campbell Morgan fan, he quotes some other preacher, and I can't tell you who he quotes, I don't remember, but G. Campbell Morgan says, and his name is not always Chief Butler. Never mind. In life, his name is not always Chief Butler. That means that a lot of people say they're going to do something for you, and they forget about you. They're not, their name is not always Chief Butler. I thought that was quaint. All right. Now, I want you to see something. It would seem as though we know we encounter Joseph at the age of 17, this begins, this chapter begins two full years after these events. In a later chapter, it says that when Joseph was 30, he stood before Pharaoh as essentially the leader of the land at 30. It says that black and white. So you do some math and see how long he went from being sold into slavery, being a servant in Potiphar's house to being in this prison, and now two full years has elapsed since the time of the interpretation of these dreams, uh, the chief butler and baker, and now it comes to pass Pharaoh has a dream. And I love the fact that if you read this, we have Pharaoh's dream, and he's very distressed because there's no one to interpret his dream. And Joseph is called to mind I like this. Joseph is called to mind uh, in verse 12, I believe. It says here, there was, a, there was with him, this would be the uh, chief butler. He says, there was with, with us a young man, a Hebrew servant, to the captain of the guard. We told him. He interpreted to us our dreams. To each man, according to his dream, he did interpret. It came to pass, as he interpreted, it all happened the way he said. So Pharaoh sends for Joseph. 
And I want you to, it's very subtle, because you read right by this sometimes. You race right by this. It's a great caricature and a Sunday school story. But if you read too quickly, you'll miss something. That the events between the age of 17, favored son, or favored son, to a few years later as a favored slave, to a few years later as now interpreter of dreams and coming out of the prison, it appears as though, and I'll use the word very carefully, the providence of God kept Joseph in a right place. I do not believe everything was wound up for him. There were so many different things that could have and did happen in the process, including the one guy when he says, remember me. And in verse 9 of chapter 41, it is the chief butler that says, I do remember my faults this day, telling about how he remembers Joseph. But two years have gone by, and it's in this time frame that it says the iron entered into his soul until the time of the coming to pass of the foretold word, the, the setting up to the place down the road where Joseph is supreme ruler of Egypt. Pharaoh will remove his rings and his gold chain and place them upon Joseph. He'll be riding in that second-in-command chariot. He will provide, after the interpretation of the dream, foretelling seven years of plenty and seven years of famine, he will provide a plan to save that entire land. Because had it not been for Joseph's interpretation of Pharaoh's dream, the provisions would not have been made, and the lineage the supposed lineage to Christ, would not have survived the famine. If you follow the famines in the Bible, there are 13 primary famines, and within all of those, you'll hear about God sent. Here, it's exactly that. So don't, don't think, well, uh, is it all wound up? No, there were possibilities for everything to happen, but when God spoke a thing, the minute the word was declared or uttered, the minute the foretelling word was uttered, it's like saying, forever, O Lord, thy word settled in heaven. There, there may be a great gap of time before the coming to pass and the fulfillment of the word, but once uttered, it must be fulfilled, or else God's a liar. And this is why it says the promise of God tried him, tested him. Now I think about this. What would I have been thinking for two solid years in that prison? Now, I don't know about you. I can only speak for me because I had to sit down and kind of think about what would I have thought being placed in that circumstance? My last hope, by the way, my very last hope was to some guy that I interpreted his dream, remember me, two years go by, I'm forgotten, I'm left here, but God never left him. God never left Joseph. And this is perhaps one of the greatest mysteries when we talk about why these two years, why not one year, why not six months, why not one month, why not never? Now, I have a reason for going down this path. How many have ever uttered this particular thought? You have actually out of your mouth has come this thing. Boy, I wish I could turn back the hands of time. Show me hands. Yeah, because I've said that too. We've all said that. I wish I could go backwards. I wish I could go back, and then I would have done things differently. And how much so, friends? How much so? Because perhaps where you are today, you stand a little bit firmer on God's word with the knowledge he brought you through and all the steps that you took, every single one, including the missteps, including the ones where you were off the track and on the mat, God gave an opportunity for you to get up forgiven, to start over again. And in the process, a little toughening happens. You know, if I really wanted to just jump right into the New Testament, I'd go right to Romans 5. That's why I think I had the mind of the Lord with the jerky Christian message that's in the bookstore. You need to hear that message. You need to be reminded of that because God is constantly putting us in those circumstances. You might say, well... <clears throat> I know what Romans 5 says, we glory in tribulations. I've yet to glory in one, by the way, but while I'm there, 
And I'd have to say that while Joseph is in prison, I'm reminded that some of the greatest work in the New Testament was done in prison by Paul. I'm reminded that outside of the New Testament and into the early church history, some of the greatest works were done in prison. Paul Bunyan being one of them. Uh, John Bunyan, excuse me, wrong, wrong Bunyan. <laughs> if he was in prison, I don't think I'd want to be there. He'd ax you to death. But having said that, I want you to see the necessity of being in a place sometimes where God has actually put you there. And he's put you there for a reason. That's why I stressed last week, you don't hear him say, I've been falsely accused. One utterance where he says, I shouldn't be in this dungeon. But he never says, hey, I'm complaining now. I'm despondent. I believe in those two years, Joseph probably did more, if you want to call it pulling down the promises of God, more praying. And if we want to call the uh, New Testament term, what everybody likes to say, being a witness, I believe his light was shining in a very dark place. God put him in that prison for a purpose. Now, I'm not saying that each time we mess up, each time we mess up, that, oh, this is God's design for me, because there'll be some that will take my words and twist them. Well, I'm, I'm in the slinger again, and not the slammer, the slinger. <laughs> this must be God's design. Not necessarily. God will, as I said, free will lets you mess up. And then God's grace lets you be covered and start over again. So in this particular picture, what I'd like you to see is a twofold concept. God can use our darkest hours where we are forced to reach and get that revealed word and claim and wrap our minds around a promise not yet not yet realized, but we know it has been said. We know it has been declared. And just like the best example is Elijah. Elijah, we encounter him marching into Ahab's court saying it's not going to rain anymore. It's, the New Testament says he prayed earnestly it wouldn't rain anymore. And if you read it carefully, because you can miss this, what we see is he marched into Ahab's court and said, it's not going to rain anymore. And then God said, go to Cherith. Go to that brook Cherith, and ravens will feed you there. He grabbed hold of a word back there in Deuteronomy where it says, when they entered into the promised land, if they worshipped idols, God would shut up the heavens. And from many generations, from the time of Joshua entering into that land until the time of Elijah, no one had grabbed hold of that that word uttered. It just remained as a word. That's why I said it can't be wound up. If it was, God would have shut up the heavens immediately. But it took an Elijah on the scene who cared more about God's word coming to pass than his own life. And he grabbed hold of that word back there in Deuteronomy, marched into Ahab's court and said, it's not going to rain anymore. As if to say, it's already done. It's already done. God has declared it. I'm claiming it. It's already done. And God says, go to a brook, and I'll feed you there with ravens. And, and we might say, well, he was in God's will because God gave him a special revelation to go to a brook. Ah, oh, well, did he feel like he was still in God's special will when the brook dried up and when the ravens ceased to fly and feed him? Each of these moments builds that endurance. That is the iron entering into the soul, being able to endure being able to stand a little bit more, being able to have a little bit more faith each time to understand God may bring us to a dry brook. He may, the provision may cease. The prison may be a reality. But in all of this, God's word is at stake. I love the fact, if you follow the history of Elijah, you might say, well, why didn't God make it come to pass sooner? At the death of Solomon, when the kingdom split and divided, upper, northern, northern and southern kingdoms. We encountered Jeroboam, who set up those uh, idols at Dan and Bethel and caused the people to sin. And from the time of Jeroboam to the time of Ahab, it was consistent. This was the pattern. Elijah said, that's it. And he took that word, 
that utterance of God that had not yet been realized. And he took it as if it was already a promise made good and stood on that. And it's mind-boggling, but I think that Joseph had the same mindset in prison. He had to have known that that utterance back there in the dream where he saw his whole family bowing down and doing obeisance to him, God gave him that revelation. This wasn't some uh, cloudy, what do they call that, nighttime... uh, you take it to go to bed, it's a natural thing. It gives you crazy dreams. Melatonin. It wasn't a melatonin dream. It was God, just as he did God entering into Joseph's dreams, just as he had done with Jacob, just as he had done with Abraham. The same concept where God gave a revelation of something that would come to pass. And in the moment that he uttered that and told his brothers, I had a dream, that was the beginning, the foretelling. So until the iron entered into his soul, until there was enough toughening, until there was the capacity for God to know this man stands on that utterance, until that time, he was tried solely. In the current church world, people are still told, name it and claim it, get it now. I'll be the one standing here to tell you that while you're busy claiming something, if you have the guts enough to stand firm and say, that's God's word, he uttered it, and I'm going to hold on until it comes to pass, you better watch out because that very same promise, that very same word of God will come and probably give you a little testing, and it'll be not to harm you. In the process of while it's happening, you may say, why is this happening? But rather it'll build up the endurance, the triedness, that produces a little bit more of a capacity to reach hold, and then suddenly I have this hope, and Romans 5 says, hope maketh not ashamed, because this hope that's in me is Christ enabling me in my darkest hours. I refuse to believe that there isn't somebody here who hasn't had that dark hour where you're sitting and you, you, you say, surely I have crossed the line with God. I'm standing in front of you honest enough to tell you that I've had many moments in my lifetime where I thought I must have just crossed the line so badly with God that surely God will turn his back from me. In fact, I once said to one of the staff people very early on, thinking I had, I had made a very grave mistake. The Bible says, lay, lay hands on no man suddenly. You know, no, no man after the flesh. I'm, I thought I made a grave mistake. Somebody asked me, will I, will I ordain people in the church? And I've said, you better do some proving to me because the first one I ordained turned out to be a real lemon. Now, that's God's problem. But, man, I was on my face before God. I mean, talk about prostrate, crying out, saying, Lord, this must be the line because this is, to me, it seems like the grossest thing a person could do. And I lamented to the staff. This has to be about seven years ago. I lamented to the staff. Maybe God will take his hand from me because this may be the very thing that the word talks about, not laying hands on anyone suddenly. And in that moment, I uttered the unpardonable. What I did, I did by faith. What I did, I did before God. Now, God took that act and made me realize he brought me through that to give me a little bit of iron, to make me realize this isn't a toy. We don't toss around. And some, some churches, they hand out ordination uh, certificates like it's, uh, it's, you know, it's bread, it's candy, it's water. I think it's very serious. I think any man or woman who desires to be ordained, I would strongly suggest that you, if pastors, if you're listening, don't ordain them. If you want that so badly, probably you should consider stepping away from that position. I did not ask for my ordination. Dr. Scott obviously saw something I didn't, but I didn't want it. I thought, why, why is this happening to me? In fact, it made me so uncomfortable. I, I was ordained at the same time as another man, and it just it really bothered me. And I, I felt like, why did God do this to me? Why did this happen? And now I know that that was God's design because had I really wanted it and pursued it, God would have said, not her, definitely not her. 
So I'm stepping forward and I'm, I'm seeing this word. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm giving you the examples now. But it had not been realized to me that Christ would give me the wisdom and the knowledge and the understanding to be able to stand and do what I do today. And I had to pass through some very dark places to get to here. People think, I just took over the ministry. I uh, commandeered. Lord, have mercy on those that think that because, trust me, had there been an exit, a way of escape, as the scripture says, I would have taken it. I'm telling you, as a person who has been in the dark place, the disappointment of watching people come and go, the disappointment of watching people who, man, if I could just take them and say, just take God's grace, just receive it, quit frustrating God, quit frustrating his plan. He has got a plan for you and you alone. And I love what Dr. Scott used to say, there'll never be another you. Don't think there's somebody else to do what only God called you to do. But you get convinced, I'm so bad, I'm so impetuous, stupid, foolish, ridiculous, whatever, you're, whatever you want to put on yourself, you can convince yourself, and others around you, by the way. God says, take my grace, it's sufficient. Take my strength, it's enough. When you're weak, I will be your strength. That's my word of promise made true. Who could foretell? Who could foresee? We are kind of a little bit like Joseph. Who could tell that that word spoken back there over me would bring me to this place right now? For you, for each one of you sitting in front of me, how many of you could say you thought your path would lead you exactly here, that every single step you took would lead you to this place? And please don't raise your hand and say you have an idea because, frankly, I don't think any of us could have really guessed we'd end up here as a body together. And that's the beauty of God's program and his plan. He knows exactly what we need. He knows exactly where we've been. Our biggest mess-ups, I'm sure it breaks God's heart to see his children just like a, a natural parent. It must be heartbreaking to see a child suffer and be tormented and be down, discouraged, despondent. But God's word says for each one of us, not only a plan and a purpose, but I'm looking at this scripture for me today and for you as a church thinking, you know, I've had those prison moments, and I'm not talking about the prisons that I go to. I'm talking about in my life, those dark times where... I don't know that the sun, he has ridiculous statements. I don't know the sun will actually come up tomorrow. Of course, you and, you and I both know it will. But in the moment of the darkness, you think it's all over. Life is just so messed up. And it is in those moments where the reality of God's presence and his uttered word becomes a promise appropriated and made real. I don't care what anybody says about what they think you ought to be as a Christian. You know what I care about? What God's word declares you are in Christ Jesus. That is the criteria. When we wrap our minds around this concept of being tried, don't think this is unique here. Malachi 3 says Christ will come, predicting the coming of the word, by the way, of the word before the word took up a tent of human flesh, declaring that Christ in Malachi 3 would be as a refiner's fire, comparing Christ and Christ's work, the same concept being used. I'm saying to you today, don't doubt in the dark what God showed you in the light. Don't look at your circumstance and say, oh, God, it's just all over for me, but rather say, God... I may be in this prison, Joseph, just two years, but by the time he was 30, this is the great wonder of this, by the time he was 30, the record's clear, he was the greatest, richest, and most powerful man in the land. And if you study the history of the strange rulers, those uh, Hyksos kings, he is part of that second wave of the Hyksos coming into that land essentially taking over that land in prosperity until you reach into the book of Exodus where when Joseph is dead, it says there rose up a Pharaoh who knew not 
Joseph after Joseph's death, which brings the people into bondage and those years of bondage until God sends the deliverer, Moses. So you can, you can look at all this and say waves that come through time even to the now. So if you're going through that dark night, I don't want to call it a dark night of the soul, but I think that's the way to put it. And you feel the weight of the iron coming into your soul is too much to bear. Remember Christ's words. He said to take his yoke. He'll take the burden off of your back. That's his specialty, by the way. Too many people want to come into the body and have a free ride. But rather, when you are heavy laden, he says, come unto me and I'll give you that rest. Come unto me and I'll take your burden. Come unto me and I'll give you the peace. Now, Joseph may just be for some of you just an Old Testament good story. For me, it gives me the comfort to know if this really probably the most perfect man in the Old Testament outside of Enoch could go through these things, not become bitter, not become jaded, survive and rise to a level of prosperity never, never before seen, that gives me the comfort that maybe, maybe I'll never rise to that great prosperity, but God will bring me through to a prosperous and peaceful place, maybe not the great riches of the world, but the great riches unsearchable that are in Christ Jesus. If you're there today, take this word and understand the word of promise will come at you, but you grab hold, claiming the other promise. His word is settled in heaven. That means it is forever and ever true in Jesus' name. I pray you'll take that today. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.